The Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin is a short story very famous and popular in America. Let's meet the writer very quickly. Who was Kate Chopin? She was a well-loved and popular feminist writer. And by feminist, I mean that uh, she simply saw that women were human beings and that the things that women experienced were worth writing fiction about. They were valuable and that women are human beings as important as men are. She lived more than a hundred years ago. So this idea was sort of revolutionary. She was a mother of six children. She lived a rich life in many ways, but she was also an artist. So her writing is how she expressed herself. And she wrote many, many things. Many of them were published during her lifetime. She was a writer of the American South, specifically Louisiana, and much of her writing is set in that time and place, and it influences uh, the writing. She writes about race, about slavery, about class, as well as about the role of women, and those are historical pieces. When she writes about the experiences of women, though, they seem more timeless, more relevant to our experiences today. And her stories have been published and popular for the last hundred years. Now, this story, The Story of an Hour, is still widely read in high schools and in colleges. This story poses a question to us. Have you personally, have you ever become aware of a difference between what you were expected to feel, what you were supposed to feel, what everybody thinks you should feel, and the reality of what you really felt. You might think of on a person's wedding day, everyone thinks you must be so happy, you must be so excited, but possibly on the inside, you're afraid, you're scared, you're unhappy. This might be a sign that you're not doing the right thing. However, it's a universal thing. There is what people expect we feel and what we really feel. I'd like you right now to think about your own experiences. When have you had this feeling? A different question. As I said, she was a feminist writer, and marriage is eternally an important question for women. What is marriage for women? What is marriage for men? How is it different? In what ways? Or would you say it's essentially the same for men or for women? Also remember that our writer wrote more than a hundred years ago, so has this changed over time? As we read fiction, I want you to remember these concepts. Tone is the mood or feeling that a writer creates. It is not the feeling of the characters. It is not the feeling of the author. It's not necessarily your feeling, but it's the feeling you get from reading the fiction. Characterization is how a writer shows the personality of the characters. So this is not just their names or appearances, but their inner selves. Who are they? What kind of person are they? A writer does not usually tell you he is a patient man, she is a funny woman, but they will have the characters act in ways that show us who they are. Figurative language, well, that means a simile or a metaphor. We have studied those. Remember that personification is a special type of metaphor. This story begins with information about Mrs. Mallard. This is the very first sentence, knowing that Mrs. Mallard was afflicted with a heart trouble. Great care was taken to break to her as gently as possible the news of her husband's death. This is an amazing first sentence for a short story. There is so much information. She's married. She has a heart problem. She has many people who care about her and love her, and they don't want to make her sick, but something terrible has happened, and that news is that her husband has died. And why is the heart trouble the very first part? Before the news of her husband dying before the fact that she has many people who love her who tell her news carefully why is this so important well there's this concept called foreshadowing foreshadowing it's where the author 
gives you a feeling about what's going to happen later in the story. What is the news? Well, her husband is dead. Now here is a clue about the setting. Uh, first of all, Richards did not check his cell phone. He did not listen to the radio. He had to use a telegram to check. And her husband is dead not because of a car accident, not because of a nuclear explosion. He's dead from a train accident. So this is some, it gives you a hint. You can infer what the setting is. This is her reaction. She wept at once with sudden, wild abandonment in her sister's arms. When the storm of grief had spent itself, she went away to her room alone. She would have no one follow her. Now, figurative language, the storm of grief. This is mm, metaphor or simile? It's metaphor. It simply means crying. In a similar way that teardrops fall down your face when you cry, raindrops fall from the sky when it rains. <sighs> she goes up into her room, and this is what she sees. I'd like you to listen to the sentence. She could see in the open square before her. In other words, the uh, before her house, there is an open area, something like a park. This is where she looks, into this park-like area. She could see in the open square before her house the tops of trees that were all a-quiver with the new spring life. The delicious breath of rain was in the air. In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song which someone was singing reached her faintly, and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. There are so many things to see and feel and smell and hear in this short description. Please notice that she doesn't do anything. Nothing happens. But she observes with all of her senses, hearing, smelling, feeling, touching. She experiences all of these things. And the inference is that, that in the world outside, no one knows her husband is dead. No one cares. The birds don't care. The trees don't care. Life keeps going on. And what does this symbol, the tops of trees with new life, birds, leaves, breeze, somebody singing the blue, what does it all symbolize? And what mood is created by all of these physical, tactile experiences? They're not emotions. They are experiences. Even though she feels sad, like crying, all of these things register. The world keeps going and it affects her. She sits in this chair and Chopin says there was something coming to her and she was waiting for it. Notice the comma, fearfully. What is she afraid of and what is it? Well, she begins to recognize this thing. Chopin does not put a name on it, but it is coming, as it says, to possess her. It's going to control her. Just like the tears, the storm of grief, possessed her, controlled her, something new is coming. She does not want it. Whatever it is, she tries to beat it back with her will, with her power, her willpower, her emotions. She resists it. She fights it. But... She is weak. She is powerless. And it compares her emotional strength to her physical strength. She has white, slender hands. So she can fight, but she can't change what's coming to her. So she gives up. Now, abandoned comes again. You have seen this word before. Abandoned, in this case, means give up. When you abandon yourself, you give up. You let it happen. She lets the feeling control her. And this is what she says, free, free, body and soul, free. The excla exclamation points indicate the emotion, the power, and the repeated word, free, free, free. How does this affect your mood? What do you think of when the word is repeated so many times? 
the vacant stare and the look of terror that had followed it. That means that when she first went up, she had a vacant stare. No thinking, no feeling, empty. And then she was afraid, terror. That came after the vacant stare. And both of these disappear. So what is the opposite of vacant? What is the opposite of terror? I don't know specifically, but it's going to be positive. In fact, Chopin says it's joy. It's a joy. Happiness. Well, what kind of happiness? Is it a monstrous joy? Is it a negative, sick, crazy, evil, bad joy? This is possible, isn't it? People with mental illnesses might have monstrous joy when they have done something bad. But she does not even ask, is this the case? She knows that it's not true. Chopin says, a clear and exalted perception enabled her to dismiss the suggestion, the suggestion that it is a monstrous joy, as trivial. She knows this new feeling is not bad. And she even says, it's trivial, it's ridiculous, it's silly to even think it is bad to feel joy. She knew that she would weep again, just as she was weeping, remember the, the storm of grief. It would come again, she would weep again, she would cry with sadness and heartbreak when she saw the kind, tender hands folded in death. She really is sad, and her husband, he is a kind man. The face that had never looked, save with love, upon her. Fixed and gray and dead. Now, this is a very old-fashioned phrase. Save with love. This basically means accept. Save with means accept. That, if you follow the negation, it means he always looked with love. He never looked at her without love. So he always looked at her with love. But the life is gone. The next time she sees him, he will be dead. There would be no one to live for during these coming years. Can you paraphrase this? There would be no one to live for. There would be no powerful will bending hers in that blind persistence with which men and women believe they have a right to impose a private will upon a fellow creature. Once again, this word will, we have seen it before. Will, it means willpower. It means the force of your personality, the strength of your emotions. There would be no powerful will bending hers the possessive means her will. No one will try to control her emotions, her inner self. In that blind persistence with which men and women... So Chopin says, this is what humans do, men and women. Humans believe they have a right to impose, that means to put their personal wishes upon a fellow creature, fellow creature, another person. In other words, very simple paraphrase. We try to control each other even though we don't know it, even though it's blind. A kind intention or a cruel intention made the act seem no less a crime. It doesn't matter if it's kind. It doesn't matter if it's cruel. When any person controls any other person, that is criminal. That is a crime. Chopin is making a powerful statement here. She breathed a quick prayer. In other words, she whispered it, maybe very soft, very light. And with her very breathing, she wants to live a long time. This is a big change. Only yesterday, she had thought with a shudder. A shudder is that unconscious, uncontrollable movement of the body when you experience horror or terror terror or disgust. Yesterday, when she thought my, my life will be long, she was horrified. 
As she comes downstairs, because Josephine comes, knocks at the door, Josephine believes that she must be heartbroken. Please, please, open the door. Mrs. Mallard is joyous. She is happy. And when she does open the door, she is compared to a goddess of victory. The battle has been inside her mind, inside her heart. The grief against the joy. The sadness of wanting to live a short life because your life is unbearable, because someone else controls you, was fighting against the joy of freedom, body and soul free. And between those two sides, the joy has won. She carried herself unwittingly. She didn't even know it, but she carried herself like a goddess of victory. So think to yourself, how would you name the two sides of this war? How would you describe who won this war? And importantly, where did this war happen? She comes downstairs, but there is a knock at the door, a sound at the door, and the door opens. Who is it? It's Brentley Mallard, her husband. And when she sees him, she dies. Her heart stops. Her family believes, oh, she was so happy. The joy that kills she was so happy to see her husband she dropped dead. But we know we have been there for one hour. Remember, this is the story of an hour. And for that hour, we were with her, looking out the window, seeing the new life, feeling the struggle, the battle inside her heart, inside her mind, and winning the victory because she was going to be free. The irony is, is that we know she dies from, well, it's up to you what you want to call it, but it's, it is not joy. Think about all of these things. Think about these sentences. I hope that you enjoy this short story, and I hope that you're able to understand some symbolism. It is a challenging short story because of the vocabulary and structure but I think you can get the meaning. Good luck.